morning. So uh, <laughs> apparently, um, we the marathon route last weekend went right beside the church, and we have all these whacking sticks that apparently my son has found. Oh, happy day! <laughs> Just hold your applause, sir, please. <clears throat> Uh, so we're on uh, week five of our Letters to Leaders series, um, and I, I don't know about you, but I've really been enjoying this series, but I suppose because I'm up here doing it, I should have to say that, but hopefully you have kind of gleaned something from these last couple of weeks, and if you've not been with us all five weeks, I'll kind of catch you up real quick. So the first week we discussed uh, humility and leadership and kind of having this servant-mindedness. Uh, if you remember, we brought uh, city manager Rob Anderson up here, and he kind of talked about what it means to have that mindset while leading an, orga an organization of 300-plus employees. The second week we talked about perseverance and leadership and how uh, it really takes a leader that is willing to go through the mess and through the mud in order to be a great leader. The third week we talked about what our legacy is going to be as leaders and as people. And I brought a couple of teachers up here, and they just gave us some incredible insight as to what it means to lead in the classroom and leave a lasting legacy in the lives of kids. And if you remember, we had the marbles, and their marbles represent every day that we have to leave a mark in somebody's life. And last week, uh, we looked at what it means to be a bold leader and to, to make those uh, bold actions and sayings and... Um, kind of behavioral changes in our life, and we, we, we really boiled it down to when, when we as leaders are willing to pray bold prayers, we need to sit back and watch what God's going to do with them then. And so this week, we're looking at what it means to lead in a world of distraction. And so uh, I have a couple books up here because the man that I'm going to uh, talk with within this interview uh, wrote both of these books and his name is Clay Scroggins. He is the uh, lead pastor of Buckhead Church in Atlanta, Georgia. And the first time that I heard him speak was at a conference down in Cincinnati, and he spoke on what is called white noise. And I thought, that is such an incredible uh, topic and idea. And this, I think this was about three or four years ago that he talked about this. Um, so it kind of has taken him that long to actually write a book on it, which is The Orange One, How to Lead in a World of Distraction. And he kind of gives us this idea that we all have distractions in life. And these distractions uh, interrupt kind of our thought process, interrupt our actions, and interrupt um, just our day-to-day -day life. And how so often we just keep going with the distraction and we fail to just press pause and listen to what the silence is telling us. And so he talks about this, this word distraction. He said the word distract, it means to draw apart. And that definition is rooted in two syllables that kind of make up the word. And the Latin verb trahir, tract, means to draw. And the prefix dis means away from. So our distractions are literally drawing us away from something. So a distraction in my life and in your life is something that draws us away from something or even someone. So yesterday I took uh, Jackson and uh, my good friend Tara. She went climbing with us in Dayton. And when you are the person belaying, the one on the bottom, you're holding the rope for the person who is climbing. And the goal is to always pay attention to the person who is climbing so that you don't drop them. I didn't drop anybody. But there's a lot of things going on, and there's a lot of things to distract the person who is holding the rope for the person that is climbing. And so the, you know, I kept thinking about today, and I'm like, man, if I get distracted, I, don't, I may not see her come off the wall or fall off the wall. And that could be really, really bad, because then she could fall. Fortunately, the cable we were using, the little well, gree gree is what it's called, it had a you know, fail safe so that I wouldn't totally drop her. But you know, the point is, we have so many things in our life that distract us, that take our attention away. We have those dings that happen on our phone, those notifications that pop up. We have forms of distraction on social media. I mean, good Lord, you can get in the, the Facebook feed and like never get out. It's like a rabbit hole, right? Pinterest is even worse. <laughs> You can, like, get lost all day on that thing, which is why I never go on it. You know, we have distractions at work. 
Maybe work is a distraction for you. We have the uh, distraction of busyness. The busier we are, that means we, we can't take a, the time to stop and really figure out what we're trying to avoid. We have addictions that are distractions for us and so much more. So you and I, we all have some form of distraction in life. We might even have a few distractions. But the question for us this morning is what if we turned down the noise? What if we looked at our distraction head on and asked, what are we trying to mask? And I had the great opportunity again to talk with Clay. So I kind of previewed this last week that he, if you, you think of like a celebrity in your field of work, whatever that is, um, this is him. I mean, it's, I had a little bit of a fangirl moment when I was at the beginning of the interview because it's, it's just not something that somebody like me would really get the opportunity for. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty big deal that, that he was wanting to do this with me and I couldn't get him here so I had to video the interview for you. Um, but we, we talked about this idea of white noise and turning down the noise and, and all these distractions that we have. Um, and again, his book came out Tuesday. And uh, so I wanted to share with you some insight, but I need to kind of preface this video. Uh, Matt, the guy who was playing bass guitar, he said it's like watching a YouTube video, so just take that for what it is. Because my internet in Fairborn was a little bit better <laughs> than his internet in, in Atlanta. Um, so there's a, there's a couple jumps in the video, um, but I tried to, to work through those in the editing process. But what I want you to see and hear is what he tells us. Because it's incredible. And I think if you and I can begin to live into some of the, the things that he has to say about white noise, about distractions, and about turning it down and being willing to listen, you and I will be better leaders because of it. So we're going to roll uh, the interview. It's about 20 minutes, so if you fall asleep, it's okay. I got it on video. I can give it to you later. Um, but uh, it really is. He's really got some great insight for us. First question is, you know, what's your, what's your background? How did you get started kind of in ministry with North Point? Uh, I know you, you've been at Browns Bridge. You were at North Point for a while, and now you're at Buckhead. Is that correct? That is correct, yep. I am taking the full tour of our churches in Atlanta. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I grew up in uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Um, they play football there. And uh, moved oh, to sorry. Atlanta to go to, they do roll, they roll with the tide. They roll hard. They roll deep with the tide. Um, I moved to Atlanta in 1998 to go to Georgia Tech. And I studied industrial and systems engineering. Um, I was not good at it. I made a deal with the registrar. I said, listen, if you will give me this degree, I promise I will never use it. And <laughs> she took me up on it. I mean, I, I passed the classes, but um, I genuinely... Uh, yeah, one of those things. There's plenty. There's so many people in the world like this that study something, have a degree in something, and don't feel equipped at all to use it. And that's kind of where I am. So, but while I was in college, best thing that happened to me is I started volunteering at North Point Community Church, which is in Alpharetta, which is 20 miles, 30 miles north of the city. And I was a high school volunteer. I took a group of guys from ninth grade, walked through high school with them, all the way through 12th grade. We were supposed to graduate at the same time. Um, I ended up failing physics too, so I had to take another semester, another lap around the, the track. Um, uh, but I, that was where I got, I, I just got addicted, or that's a terrible way to say it maybe, but I just got, my heart really came alive to the idea of ministry. So moved to Dallas, Texas to go to seminary, met my wife there. It was the best thing that happened while I was at Dallas Seminary. Um, moved back to Atlanta. Uh, it was back to Atlanta for me. My wife's from Texas, so she is um, a fish out of water in this city. Um, but we now have five kids. We have a 10, 8, 6, 4, and a 2-year-old. And we are loving life. It's busy. It's crazy. It's wild, but it's awesome. My wife just bought this little uh, canvas that hangs in our living room that says, These are the days. And um, it was so funny to try to explain that to our 10-year-old and 8-year-old. They're like, what do you mean, these are the days? Like, what does that mean? You know, and I'm like, I mean, like, these are the days, you know? Um, but that's how we feel. We're like, hey, this is, this is uh, we're in it. We are fully in it. 
Yeah. So you, how long have you been at Buckhead? Not very long, right? No, I just started here three months ago. Um, and I, that was a huge transition for us because where we were living, it just wouldn't have made sense for me to work here and live where we were living. And so we ended up moving. So we now have a city of Atlanta address. We live about a mile and a half north of our church. Buckhead's like the business uh, and entertainment district of Atlanta. It's about just three or four miles north of the city. Um, so it's, uh, it's a different clientele, but doing the same job. So uh, Andy had been here the previous 18 months and he and I just basically switched places. Um, but it's been good. We've loved it. Our kids are plugged into a new school. Um, they're doing great. My wife's loving it. Um, it's been a it's been a big transition, but it's been a good one. I think what I've I saw I visited a couple of the campuses or you know different churches, a part of the North Point system, and you all have your own kind of um, culture. And I think yeah. it's going. You know, we were at Buckhead a couple of years ago uh, for a conference and. You know, Buckhead is way different than Brownsbridge, and Brownsbridge was way different than when we were at Gwinnett uh, this past uh, week. So it's it's really neat to see how you kind of en engulf your communities that you're in and uh, do ministry for those communities. So anyway, yeah, that's cool. That I, cool. I uh, I would agree with that. I mean, I think there obviously every organization's got to have its spine. You know, it's got to have that thing that runs through. And and for us, we try to keep that really small. That it's basically that uh, we want to be a church that an unchurched person would love. Um, but other than that, um, there's some things we agree upon on how we should do things, some values, um, but we really try to contextualize the community that we're in. The, you know, the truth is, though, Megan, as you know, people are people. It doesn't matter where you live and what you're dealing with. Um, you know, but you're more likely to find somebody here that's trying to figure out, um, oh my goodness, my prayer request that I can't figure out where I should park my yacht that's a the beach right. right now. You know, you're more likely to deal with somebody like that than uh, you are at maybe some of our other campuses. But And there's also a larger population of um, people that are living near or below the poverty line. So um, it's just a, yeah, it is a wildly diverse audience here, in a, uh, very uh, racially diverse here, which we're really excited about. Um, really want to continue to lead, love um, all kinds of people really well. So. It's a, it's a fun ride. So you uh, recently wrote a book, and actually it just came out uh, yesterday or the day before? Uh, t uh, Tuesday, uh, two Tuesday. days ago. Yeah, so it's 48 th hours ago. Yeah, very cool. Um, so what was your motivation behind this book in particular, How to Lead in a World of Distraction? Yeah. Um, it's mainly all the kids that we're having trying to get them through college primarily. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, kidding, but not kidding. True, but, uh, <laughs> true, but no. Um, what happened for me was I started recognizing the plethora, the abundance of distraction in my own life. And, and, and I, you know, I've, I've had a lot of people that say, oh, that's so, um, I've had a few people that have said, yeah, that's really relevant, you know, with social media and technology and all the things that are so, that are so, um, that are creating so many distractions. But the book is, you know, the, the kind of the turn of the book, you know, everything's got to have something that's uh, interesting about it or worth uh, a, maybe a layer, hopefully a layer deeper than just don't use technology or be careful with technology or don't watch out for social media. It's really what, what, what I wanted to talk about was more about what's on the other side of the distraction because every distraction costs us something that when you are focusing on something, you're you know, driven in some way, I mean, that's which essentially is what distraction, just that simple word, dis, away from traction, the ability to move quickly, the ability to move forward, distraction keeps us from moving forward, that's what it does, and so when you're focused on moving forward and something, you know, that pops out of nowhere, it creates a distraction, we lose the ability to create momentum in our life, uh, worse than that though, there's something internally inside of us that wants to distracted and that's what I wanted to write about is what is that thing that keeps me loving the distractions that I love because every single one of us has our fingers on the dial of some kind of distraction that we turn up and we turn down based on how things are going on in life um, and what I found is that there's just a lot of negative internal emotion that every one of us is dealing with maybe it's something from our past something that 
Uh, we're in the middle of circumstances right now that are causing something to be exposed or come to the surface. And so we just use that distraction knob and we turn it up. And the distraction, you know, it could be anything. It could, and usually it's something that's not even that bad. It could be Netflix or uh, social media or it could be uh, shopping or exercise or work. Uh, the most difficult thing is sometimes it's ministry. Sometimes ministry is the distraction that we turn up to keep us from having to pay attention to what's inside of us. And so that's really what this book is all about is um, how do you lead in a world of distraction? Well, you turn down the noise low enough and long enough to be ruthlessly curious of what's going on inside of you. So uh, in your chapter, White Noise, I've been kind of walking through your book. Um, you know, you said something and it says, before we can lead with passion, we need to turn down the noise. We need to find space and quiet and quite to learn how to listen, to hear what's being said inside us, where there's pain, there are fears, where there are dreams, there are hopes that we never said out loud. But a, being a better version of you demands that you turn down the noise. The future of you, your spouse, your kids, your people you hope to lead, they all demand you turn down the noise. And then you talk about three steps on, on how we as people and we as leaders can do that. Can you, can you briefly just walk us through those steps? Yeah, for sure. Let me just, um, if I could, let me quickly just set up that white noise illustration because yeah, it's, it's really what helped me. Um, I, I'm a, I need illustrations. I need, I need handles. I need things, to, ways to understand it. Um, I've got, we have little kids, and so ever since they were babies, we used white noise machine, noise machines. And I don't know, you know, I don't know how life works, but at some point, I started trying to think through that that idea of why do we turn up the volume of the noise to keep our kids sleeping. Um, that's just a, it's a counterintuitive concept in a way, but the reason why is because white noise is a masking tool. It's a device that masks noises. It keeps you from being distracted by the, did you just turn it on just now? Uh, no, that's probably my fan and my air conditioner oh. house. <laughs> um, I thought you were like giving us an illustration. It's perfect. Cue the, cue. Um, <laughs> cue the noise. It, it, um, the, there are things that want our attention but we turn up that noise so we don't have to hear them, we don't have to pay attention to them. So what I've learned is, in the same way that white noise does that to sound, to ambient noises that we don't want to be distracted by, uh, we all have our fingers on the dial of some kind of noise that keeps us from paying attention to what's going on inside of us, that masks those things inside of us. And so a simple way to think about it, when I was in college, I drove this white Volvo that always had problems. The check engine light is constantly coming on, um, anybody who is listening right now that has driven or currently drives a Volvo, they're amazing cars, and Volvo people are dedicated, uh, cult-like people, but um, they do sometimes require a lot of maintenance. Well, I would, uh, I didn't have a lot of money, because I was just a college student trying to pay my way through school, and so whenever the check engine light would come on, um, and I would hear something in the engine, I would just turn the radio up loud, right. so I didn't have to hear it, <laughs> as if that was going to do anything. Then they're done that, yep. <laughs> the problem is, you know, that's, it's haha, uh, kind of funny that we would do that to a car, but the problem is every single one of us is doing that with something in our life. Um, that we are all using some kind of distraction to mask or avoid what it is inside of us that we don't want to pay attention to. And so those three steps that you mentioned, Megan, were just real simply, what I, what I try to do myself, what I'm trying to do myself, what I encourage others to do is to, number one, to just identify the noise, which you identify the distraction that is common to you. There are some that are more common to leaders, um, but there are some that are just common to humans. Um, I mentioned some of them earlier. And then would you be willing, number two, to experiment with it? Turn it down. Uh, turn it down for a week. Turn it down for a day. Turn it down for an hour. You know, obviously don't get crazy with it. Don't cut your internet off. You know, don't get rid of your phone. You know, don't do something crazy like, you know, I, I know a lot of friends who will try to go have dinner with friends and put their phone in a basket in the middle of the table. That's a great, simple thing to do. Just to experiment and go, hey, what does this do? A lot of people are freaking out right now, probably, because they're wondering, well, how would I take pictures of my food if I didn't have my phone with me, which is a great question. Uh, but that's a bridge that I think is worth um, uh, crossing. But try something. Try driving to work without the radio on. Try turning Fox News off when you get home just for an hour. Um, try sleeping with your, you know, putting your phone in a different room when you sleep at night. Uh, try using an hour of your day to think about, to pray, to meditate, to write down things you're grateful for. There's a hundred ways you could experiment with it, but the point of experimentation is you're turning down the noise to listen. 
You're just turning it down low enough and long enough to be ruthlessly curious of what's going on inside of there. Um, and then thirdly, would you listen to what it's masking? Would you listen to what's there? And a lot of times there's not going to be anything there, but sometimes uh, you're going to hear something and you're going to go, what, what is that? Is that? Is that anger from my past? Is that uh, jealousy of some other life that I wish I was living? Is that discontent with my own life? Is that this feeling of loneliness or a feeling of inadequacy? Um, it could be a number of different things, but the beauty of the concept is that uh, if you and I can learn how to turn it down on a regular basis, then I believe that's what opens up space for God to start dealing directly with those emotions. And God doesn't leave us alone to do that. He walks with us through it. And it will ultimately make you a better person, but it'll certainly make you a better leader um, because it'll make you more emotionally aware. And the best leaders are the most emotionally healthy leaders. And so that's the, that's the, the gist of the whole book. Now, um, anybody who was thinking about buying it, you don't even find it. Yeah. It's all right there. Um, so you've, you've talked on this white noise a couple of times, and I think I've even heard you preach on it. And I think you did. Did you do an entire series on white noise at one point? I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah. And I, I think the concept is so fascinating because we struggle so much as people in general of turning it off. You know, it's yeah. like there's this fear of, I don't want to be silent. I mean, even just taking a, a minute moment of silence is so uncomfortable because heaven forbid of what we're going to hear or experience or feel. Um, so I was so excited when I was reading this book, and that was the main gist of it because I thought this is such an important topic um, because we don't talk about it a lot. We don't we don't want to get you know emotional and, and you know, for whatever reason. And uh, so I, I appreciate you so much uh, being willing to tackle that conversation. Um, so kudos to you. Well, well, thank you that, you know, um, we are having a mental health crisis in America right now. And, it, you know, it's obviously um, a good friend of a lot of people in ministry, Jared Wilson, a pastor, uh, about two weeks ago, took his own life. And it, you know, it's, it's really, uh, fortunately and unfortunately, it has shined a spotlight on an incredibly important topic. Um, I don't know enough about suicide, and I haven't personally dealt with it enough to even feel... Uh, any sense of adequacy on speaking on behalf of it, but I can say that the healthiest thing any one of us could do is create rhythms in our life where we are turning down the noise to listen to what's there. And it doesn't matter if you're a mom with little kids, if you're somebody that's working 70 hours a week trying to climb the corporate ladder, if you're uh, having a tough season where you just lost a relationship or have, walking through a broken relationship, you owe it to yourself, you owe it to the people around you, and you owe it to your future self to turn down the noise and allow this to be a season where you're being as introspective as ever uh, for the sake of growth, for the sake of uh, learning whatever it is that God might want to tell you in the middle of that uh, of the season that you're in. And Megan, you know this is uh, just like so many other pastors have experienced it, God doesn't shout above the noise. Uh, God is a God that will allow us to turn it up as loud as we want. For sometimes it feels like as long as we want. Um, but eventually, there come times in life when we the noise just gets turned off and it wasn't our choice. And unfortunately, it's in those moments that we're usually asking God those tough questions. But the great news is, for every one of us, we don't have to wait until those moments. Um, we can turn it down. Um, and, and we and not just turn it down once, but we can create rhythms of turning down the noise so that we can listen to what's really there. So I think it's, um, I, I just think it's, not only is it healthy, but it might be um, more important now than ever before because of the massive amounts of distraction I, that we're dealing with in society. Yeah, I completely agree with you, which is, again, why I wanted to talk with you and just add this into our, our, our leadership series that we're doing at church because it's such an important topic. And um, So you then kind of walk into these villains of leadership. And, and again, as I we spoke before, we're doing this series, Letters to Leaders, and I thought, man, you talk about these three villains of leadership and then creating some healthy habits. Can you briefly uh, just kind of hit those real quick for us and what that would look like for us as a church to kind of live into those models? Yep, absolutely. Um, I'll give you the three, and here's what I see for leaders that are most common leaders. And then I'll just pick one of the uh, habits that I think might be most helpful to people that are um, watching. I 
um, you know, this, the, the exercise of writing this was so helpful for me because it made me have to ask the question, what, what are the common forms of distractions that leaders lean on, um, that leaders have their fingers on the dial of? I really see three of them. There's probably more. You might see different ones. But for me, it's the appearance of success. Every leader has something in him or in her that wants to appear successful. Um, I recently went through a season where I was experiencing some failure for the first time uh, in the last couple of years, and it was so um, it was a a really healthy exercise for me in the end because it was exposing something in me that I had this fear of failure that I never even realized was there, or definitely didn't realize it was as great as it was. But we don't like um, we don't like that feeling, and so we constantly turn up the appearance of success. And too often in my life. I want to put off the appearance of success more than I actually want success. And that's a dangerous place to be. It's why it's such a dangerous distraction. Um, the second one is the, um, the a, a, appeal of certainty, which, you know, this is probably more, maybe more for pastors um, than business leaders. I, I, I don't know if I can say that or not. I just know for pastors this is certainly a thing. Because pastors are looked to... Um, for certainty. People want to know, hey, tell me what is going to happen. And it, uh, you know, after a while, when you're in a position where people are constantly looking to you for answers, you just start realizing, oh, I have to have an answer. And the truth is, there are so many complicated situations in life that don't actually have black and white answers. And so sometimes that, that certainty that we want to crank up uh, is dangerous. It can be really dangerous when we feel like we have to have an answer to everything. There's something powerful about saying, you know what, I don't actually know. I think we ought to figure this out together. And that's a, that's a much healthier, more appropriate answer. Um, and then thirdly is um, the idea of progress. That every single one of us want to feel like we're moving forward. And leaders, more than anyone else on the planet, love the idea of progress. Um, you know, I, I, I feel it in traffic. I would rather drive out of my way on a country road, fully 17 miles out of the way, just to keep moving, than yep. sit on the interstate going three miles per hour. And I think most leaders are like that as well. The danger is progress sometimes requires us going backwards, stopping something, shutting something down, in order to move forward. And so uh, that that addiction of progress can really become. Um, a distraction that we're constantly turning up because we don't like hearing what's really in our organization or what's really on our team or what's really inside of ourselves. Um, so I give four habits. I say, hey, here's four things that I think leaders need to do in order to turn down the noise. They're all rooted in spiritual discipline, spiritual practices. My favorite one is pressing pause, is the idea of just saying, hey, there are things in life that I'm just going to stop. And I'm not going to stop them forever, but I'm going to stop them for a certain season of time. And it's what fasting is. You know, fasting is I'm, I'm not going to eat lunch today so that I can listen, so that I can hear, so that I can feel this dependence on God that I wouldn't feel any other way. Um, Sabbath is a form of pressing pause. The daily, the, the weekly rhythm of working all week and then at the end of the week taking a day of rest to let God know, hey, I know that I need you. I know that I want to trust you, and I need you to remind me that my life doesn't revolve around my work. I need you to remind me that my work's going to continue to go on even when I leave the planet. Um, and it's amazing how life works, but, you know, when somebody, when we lose somebody who we even feel like is, you know, irreplaceable on our team, uh, every, you know, people might be sad for a week or a month, but the, the earth just fills in around the person, and we just, we just move on. And the same thing's true for you, and the same thing's going to happen to me. And a Sabbath, a weekly Sabbath, just gives us that reminder. And so learning how to press pause, when to press pause, um, learning how to do it in a rhythm, um, not just a one-time thing, is a, it's a way of turning down the noise low enough and long enough to be ruthlessly curious at those emotions that are inside of you. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, it's we've been kind of going pretty blitzkrieg, it feels like, all 2019 over here in Ohio. And um, more than once, we've... We've just said, you know, we need, a, we need a hit pause and we need to just be still for a moment and pay attention to really what, what God is doing in us and through us um, as, as, a, and as a church. Um, so, so those are kind of the main questions I had for you, um, on the book at least. So my last one would be, so as a church, as a whole, um, if that was one thing that we could do as a church to immediately kind of put into practice how to lead in a world of distraction, what would that one thing, in your opinion, be? Yeah, I just would, um, 
I guess the last thing I would say about in, in light of that question is this is never going to feel urgent. Um, but sometimes the most important things in life are the things that don't ever feel urgent but are the most important. And this is one of those. Um, and this is also hard. And I've just learned anything in my life that's worth anything has been hard. Yeah. And so I would just say, hey, just because this doesn't feel good immediately, you know, to, to get quiet, to speak to yourself like you want to speak to yourself, um, to press pause, to, to, to find a simpler way of life, of course it's not initially easy. Um, but lifting up our feet and just going along with our culture is uh, a pretty terrible game plan for how to live our life. And it's definitely not a game plan that we see the first century church do. In fact, they were or, um, they were like those fish, honestly, that swim upstream. And I think living this kind of life, deciding I'm going to be the kind of person that's turning down the noise low enough and long enough on a routine basis, um, it's going to feel countercultural. Um, it's going to feel, at times, it's going to feel hard. Um, but anything in life that's worth anything is just sometimes hard. But it doesn't mean it's not important. In fact, I think it might be one of the most important things we could do to become a healthier version of ourselves in 2019. So again, thank you for uh, humoring me and, and allowing me to show you that. Um, again, I, I do apologize for some of the goofiness of the video, but again, like Matt said, it's like watching a YouTube thing. And I could have given you all that. I could have said all that stuff from the book. But he just had such a way of saying it. Um, and he added so many other little, little trails uh, of, of, of good things that I thought, man, this is... This is valuable enough for me to, to risk, you know, everybody's getting, getting up and walking out this morning and saying, this isn't what church is supposed to be. Um, so I, I hope that you got something from what he had to say. Uh, because what I heard was this idea of pressing pause and being still. And so I got a little curious, uh, you know, because this being still idea is pretty biblical. And in fact, there are a couple verses that, that I found that highlight this a lot, and I just want to give them to you real quick. Um, so Exodus 14:14 14, 14 says, "The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. The Lord will fight for us, so we don't need to rush, we don't need to force things. We don't need to freak out. We just need to press pause and be still. Nehemiah 8, the, the Levites carried all the people saying, "Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Be still. This is a holy day. Psalm 37. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. Be still before the Lord. Don't worry. Don't panic. Wait patiently. Anybody like that one? No, I don't like waiting patiently. <laughs> Medina does. Wait patiently, which is so very hard. But it's that idea of pressing pause and sitting and listening to what that silence and that stillness has to say. Probably my favorite one of all, Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. And what I love about this one is what the translators did with it, because it says be still and there's a comma. What do we do when there's a comma in a sentence? We pause. And every time I read this one, I'm reminded to be still, comma, and pause. And I'm reminded that it, it doesn't matter what kind of chaos life feels like it's going. It doesn't, doesn't matter uh, if it's, it's the worst day in my life. It, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm reminded in Psalm 46 to be still, comma, and pause. And then know that whatever it is I'm dealing with, God is God and I am not, which is always a good thing. And then Mark 4, 39. Jesus, he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. So in the midst of this chaos, and the, and the wind howling, and the waves crashing all around the disciples in this boat that they were in, Jesus didn't command things to kind of hype up. He commanded things to be calm and still and quiet. 
There is so much that you and I as people and as leaders can learn in the stillness and the quiet. We just have to be willing to go there. And as, as he said, it is hard and it's not easy because there are things that we are going to hear and learn and listen for and be experienced uh, with that, that when we hear those, those silent moments and experience that it is going to be maybe terrifying. Because there are things that we are masking. There are things that we don't want to address. There are things that we don't want to face. And so we remain busy. We fill the void with the noise so that we don't have to deal with it. But we will be better leaders and better people and better followers of Jesus if we are willing to press pause and listen to what is happening. So we, you and I were created to take moments and be still. Listen to the silence, listen to what's going on. So when you pause this week, and I hope you do, know that you're doing something biblical. It's a good thing. Got your biblical check mark out for the day, right? And you're totally being like Jesus, because he did this too. And as a final reminder, when we lead in a world of distraction by turning down the noise low enough and long enough, we are allowing ourselves to be ruthlessly ruthlessly curious to what is going on. So may we be people and may we be leaders who take time to turn down the noise. I was thinking this song, turn down for what? <laughs> we're turning down for the noise. That's what we're turning down for. But may, may we be people who rid ourselves of those distractions in life and truly listen to what the silence and the stillness is telling us. I believe that you and I are called to live this way. So, I'm willing to turn down the noise. Are you willing to turn down the noise? I hope so. And I pray that in those moments, God does something absolutely incredible in your life so that you can be free from whatever distraction is holding on to you. So, I have two books to give away. Four books, actually, but two different kinds. And... Again, just like always, you can come up and get them after church or after the worship service is over. So the first one um, is how, how to lead, uh, what is it? I forget what it is. How to lead when you're not in charge. Uh, so this is this idea that when you're not the boss, what do you do? Do you have any authority? Do you have any leverage? And it's an incredible book and it truly changed how I uh, lead in life and in ministry. The second one, again, is how to lead in a world of distraction. And even though you hear the Cliff Notes version this morning, uh, he's got a lot more stuff in there. Um, that I, I truly believe if we, if we grasp onto will change how we, how we lead and how we live. I'm going to pray and then the band's going to come up. We're going to take up our offering and then you guys can have the uh, rest of your Sunday. Lord, we thank you for not the chaos, but we thank you for the quiet. We thank you for the moments in life when we are calm, when we are still, and life is silent. And Lord, it's, it's in these moments that even though they are uncomfortable, we know you do some amazing work in and through us. And so this morning, we're going to experience, for just a brief moment, some stillness, some silence, and some quiet. And Lord, I pray that you do something in this brief moment in us that helps us to turn down the noise turn down the distraction so that we can focus on what it is you're trying to say. Lord, in these moments, we are waiting here for you. We're waiting here for you. Speak to us. Change us. Mess us up for the glory of your name. And ultimately help us to turn it down so we can turn you up. It is in your holy and awesome and glorious name. All God's people said, Amen. 
Amen. Go in the grace and our love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has called us as people and as leaders to press pause and turn down the noise long enough, low enough, to be ruthlessly curious to what we are trying to hear. May we turn down the noise this week. May we be better people because of it. Go in peace. Amen.